this is uh, Maurice Castro Nuovo, uh, who uh, a good friend and, and a co-worker of mine going way back to the early 90s. We worked at IBM together. And uh, Mo uh, stayed at a site where we were at a, a, probably the highest pressure environment I've ever seen. Uh, uh, Phil is of his largest presence on the stock exchange. So Mo really understands availability uh, as a control. And I asked him to do a talk for me with very short notice. Uh, Mo's got a lot of Active Directory uh, uh, experience in Azure. So go, Mo. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, well, before I start, I just want to say uh, thanks, Larry, for doing this because this is a, a great thing you're doing. And it's really no surprise because you do these kind of things all the time. Um, it really, you know, you're there to do for the common good and you don't just say that, you know, I, I see it all the time and, uh, just, uh, I've known you for a long time and, and really I can, I can vouch for the fact that, that th this is a common thing that you do and, and thank you for doing well, that. Thank you very much. And, well, you know, I, I think what, 94, it. when did you come into uh, CG, IBM? When did you? Mm. 94, but I don't yeah, think we yeah. met till 95, 96. Well, that was when we started working. I, 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 but actually, I remember you in meetings, and I remember hearing about you too. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I think you interviewed Marshall. Marshall, are you here today? I think you interviewed him. Oh, right? I did. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Yeah. All right. So go that's ahead. Right. What do you What do you got for okay. us today? So um, I, I know I see we have a lot of people out there, and um, you know, my talk. Uh, Larry asked me to do this late, uh, over the weekend. And uh, which I'm totally happy to do. So that's what uh, that's uh, I'm going to show you some slides of, of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I basically took a step at a high level. View. I'm going to take a high level view of Active Directory um, and its building blocks. Talk about Azure a little bit near the end and, and go through some some uh, look at some real world uh, or a real world uh, environment. So that. I'm, Hey, Mo, yeah, I'm, I'm being asked, um, could you, could you uh, get me these slides and then I'll share them in the Dropbox for these guys? Sure. Uh, after it's over? Yeah, after it's over. Yeah, yeah do okay. that now. Great. All right. Um, great. So um, with, that, with that said, not, it, basically, I'm, I'm taking a, 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 um, a chapter out of your book, Larry, in that I'm going to talk about AD and Azure, and I'm going to do it my way. And, and you know, hopefully Joe Lewis would be proud of the fact that I'm not following. Um, I'm really just letting you know, I'm going to give you uh, uh, pieces of information about my experience with Active Directory and how I used it. There are many ways to implement it. And, and what I'm going to be showing you is, is ways that I've used it and the things that I find are, are pretty important in, 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 in managing that. I'm Guys, sorry, I, I just want to also add to to, to the students. Uh, my, Mo's approach, by the way, is very humble. I've never uh, I've worked with anybody who understated their abilities more. So whatever, if Mo says he knows a little, he knows more. Nah, <laughs> nah thanks, Larry. But that, uh, you know, I'm sure there are a lot out there that, that can add a twist to this, which is great because we're here to all learn um, and, and uh, just make, uh, make things better. So um, what I'm going to do is really we're going to talk about an example environment, talk about AD building blocks, and then work with, with the real thing. So uh, last night, I, I have an, a free Azure tenant. So last night, I built, I built a domain out in Azure with, with some. So I, I built a domain that's, that's called uh, uh, for a company called Quasar Corp. I'm trying to go by your Star Trek theme, Larry, although I'm not a, a, a deep uh, Actually, Star Max Trek. Quasar has been my hacker name since That's my right. Commodore 64 days. It, uh, I, I made up that name when I was first going on bulletin boards. That was my bulletin board hacker name. <laughs> <laughs> no, I figured I would go with that theme. And of course, you are the CEO of, of it uh, um, and, and make the company run. But in any event, I created a forest called Quasar.com. And in that forest, we have we have uh, two sites, P a, a, P a PHL site, and uh, which is, uh, stands for Philadelphia. And within that, it has a uh, a PHL DC, which is an Active Directory Domain Controller. Within that site as well is a PHL mm -hmm. server and a PHL client. Now that site is you know sites are 
think of sites as logical groupings uh, of objects and, and things uh, in, that are brought together to, to kind of optimize operations in Active Directory. And in this particular PHL site, um, we, we associate, I associated this network 10.0.0.0 .0 .0 .0 um, in, in, in the environment, in the domain. So basically, it's a logical grouping of, of machines um, within that site. Um, on the other side, there's a Chicago site. And in there is simply just a, a, a Chai DC domain controller. And that network associated with that site is 10.0.1.0 slash 24. Um, now I, I would have put more machines on there, but I ran out of CPU in my in my uh, my Azure uh, my Azure free free tenant. So this is what we're 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 going with. But it, it'll that's all that's fine. Out. Simple is better. Simple is better. That's great. Absolutely. And so as part of that, you'll see that we'll get get involved in this a little bit, but we'll see that there's a number 100 there, and that's an associated site cost and um, and I'll, we'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but really just try to keep this in mind. This is the, the scenario um, that we have. And um, so we're going to go and let me, let me bring it up while I, while I have it. Uh, so within my tenant that I have here, I've, I've, this is the Azure portal that, 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 that I, that I uh, created. And I have these virtual machines that I talked about. So we have a Chai DC domain controller, PHL client, which is a Windows 10 workstation, PHL DC, which is the DC in Philadelphia, PHL server, which is a member server in there as well. So that's just a peek into what, what the environment is. And so uh, what I want to talk about are the building box blocks of AD. So, you know, as part of that, we're going to talk about uh, uh, Windows Server versions. I've worked with it from 2000 on up. Um, so we'll just touch on those briefly. Talk about what what did what did what did the DCs do? What are what are their functions? Uh, DNS DNS plays a, an important role in 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 AD. Um, uh, you're because, being humble again. You've worked on yeah. it. It's three five one on up. It wasn't called a direct wasn't domain. Called. They were primary domain controllers and backup domain. But that's that's correct. I didn't want to yeah. go back that far because then people <clears throat> will think I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, topology, sites, and services, what role they play. Um, provide some insight into authentication. Uh, AD is a collection of objects, and some of the, the main ones that, that, that you work with are users, groups, and computer objects. We also have group policies, which really provide a way to, to provide a baseline for user objects and, and computer objects to try to develop or, or really uh, um, create a form of consistency when it comes to settings that are applied to computers and, and users. DFS is a, a, another um, another service that 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 is common in AD. I, I really actually like that, l l used it quite a bit, and and really uh, thought it, it it was it was useful. And I'll go. I will actually, Larry. That's good. You're a visionary I, to bring that up. Um, in the three five one four zero days of NT, uh, we we were hampered by something that that we'll go into later. That DFS really helped it, it quite a bit when it, when it when and that is again distributed files. oh i'm sorry yes distributed file systems and then we'll talk about time time's important in ad um and then we'll talk about the delegation of privileges which i think kind of ties in what you what you what you talk about all week and, and yeah especially and, in day four we're going to talk about how we do like a hybrid uh, uh, on day four we'll be talking about how we do like a hybrid um administration model so i can have like a you know uh centrally managed apps and then you know decentrally managed or departmentally managed apps so yep okay great um so windows server progression so it, it, as larry said it started really with nt351 and then nt40 um the 
the term or label Active Directory didn't come out until Windows Server 2000. Um, then th that was followed by 2003. Um, 2008 R2 to me was was a little bit of a game changer in in, in what in, in the environments I worked in because it introduced Hyper-V. Um, at the time that that we were upgrading from 2003 to 2008, uh, it Domain controllers weren't virtualized. It, it wasn't a common practice. So we were faced with a, uh, a decision, well, do, where do we put it on? Do we put it on the VMware well-established hypervisor uh, or do we put it on Hyper-V, which is, which is uh, relatively new? Um, the decision was made in, in, in our mind, it was really we wanted to go one-stop shop. And as part of that, um, we, we implemented Hyper-V because if we had an issue with the hypervisor, that was that was an, we engaged Microsoft. If we had an issue with the virtual machine, it was again Microsoft, and again it's a DC. Again, we, we basically had had to work or, or work with Microsoft solely for any any potential issues that could come up. Whereas in the other in the other situation, we would have VMware, and it's not knocking VMware because they're still the established leader. It was just the, the strategic direction that we took to try to just and I imagine that. that argument happens a lot and I imagine that takes a few meetings to negotiate through I imagine there was a few champions wanted to stick with VMware right I can almost imagine who they might have been in, in your scenario it, yes and but you know what kind of helped is at the time VMware was was used strictly for lab work so I think the the, the argument was made easier because that's all it was, it was done in a particular uh, company. You didn't already have it in production. Exactly. Okay. Right. Exactly. So if it was in production well established and we had back end SANS holding the virtual machines, I think the argument would have been, you know, could have, would have been made to be able to go to it and just kind of be consistent. Yeah. So, yeah. And, Good stuff. and lay down a front framework. So after 2008, 2012 R2, uh, it was the next version and you know throughout this time I think 2000 and 2003 there were big changes in, in Active Directory um, in 08 uh, Hyper-V and, and again there were incremental changes and in 2012 R2 and then we have Windows Server 2016 and then and then again 2019 so just just to give you an idea of the history of where things came where we came from with active directory and where it is today um, and yeah, uh, Larry. Uh, yeah i just said uh, to 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 make testable concepts for people active directory is uh, uh, microsoft's implementation their their security kernel they're designed to how to meet the requirements for x.500 so X.500 is the actual requirement. That's an ISO standard. That's why you are this name at that organization or whatever. So that's going to be very important to us to X.500. We use X.509 certificates to validate that claim name. And because it's Microsoft's implementation, it wouldn't be incorrect to say that you could use an X.509 certificate, a PKI certificate, to validate your Active Directory objects which include all users and, and machines and other things. Yep. Very cool. All right. Great. Thanks. Um, so we talked about the server version. Let's talk about DCs. What do DCs do? What, what are their, their main function in life? And DCs host, this is the, this is the main crux here. It's a database. Uh, and, and this is the file, the, the file, it's the ntds.dit file that has everything. Um, that the ntds.dit file, and just to show you, I'm going to be bouncing around. I have, you know, I have, a, I have remote sessions into uh, the Philly DC, the Chicago DC, a, ser a Philly server, and a Philly client. So I'll be bouncing around. Hopefully, things won't get uh, you won't get too dizzy. But anyway, so if we if we head on to this DC. Uh, Uh, okay, so this is the file. So this holds everything um, that uh, practically, I should say, 
that that's associated with AD. It's the ntds.dit file. And just to get a peek into that, um, let me try to get to. on here. Okay, so what I'm showing here is really a representation of what is is contained in the ntds.dit file. So in Active Directory users and computers, it's a common tool that's that's used, a graphical tool that is uh, 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 to manage objects within Active Directory. More so in the last 10, 10, 8 to 10 years, uh, all, a lot of the stuff that, that you can do in, the, in, in the, uh, the, the tools, the admin tools, can be done via PowerShell. But I th think this just kind of illustrates things a little bit more. Um, so within, within AD, we, uh, we have, we show this is the domain, quasar.com domain. And within it, you will, you will notice it is made up of these containers called organizational units. Um, and within those containers, uh, so you, you, basically organizational units, you know, you'll hear the term logical grouping, just like we talked about sites. Well, there are the organizational units allow you to group things together that make sense to the environment that you're in. And every environment is different. Um, so, yeah. Bo, could I interject? When when this was first brought up to me, um, and and you were involved, it was it was a three five one one, and a, a mutual friend of ours <clears throat> had done a logical setup for people, right? And what made sense by um, a by process area, and they did it by they said, oh, we'll create one for sales. And then they realized, and keep in mind, this is uh, 90s, the 56K, maybe T1, 1.54 megabits links didn't support the replication of this. And he said, when you design your object, you don't want to do this twice. You're the way you architect your forest. Your, so <laughs> he said it was not easy to reorganize things and realizing logic didn't always make sense with physical limitations. Yeah, that's true. That's Replication true. was horrible. So there was performance issues as to why you had to go one way. I imagine that's become less thing. That's probably the advantage of the, the cloud is that you can, you can do it more logically the way that works for you and just accept the availability is now going to be there. Yes, yes. That, 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 that's sort of, it's a thing you don't even think about anymore. It's like an appliance that the pipe is fat enough that, that it doesn't even, you know, at the time, uh, it was a consideration, and now it really, it really becomes more of an issue of trying to keep the replication simple. Um, and and we'll talk a little bit about that. It, you you really don't want you really want to um, work in, in a topology that is more hub spoke, or at least that's what I've worked in, and then, and that's worked well. So. As part of that, Larry, uh, instead of breaking up into functional departments in, 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 the, in the environment, um, it made more sense to really break it up by sites. So we, we, the administrative model um, lend itself, the, the way the company worked was we want to make it site centric. So this, this is I see for performance, that's always true of legacy systems. I don't know of any, uh, you know, uh, fortune 1000 company that, you know, been around for 10, 20 years that didn't do this because of those legacy stuff. So even though it doesn't make sense now, when, when somebody says it's not a problem now, remember we're dealing with legacy stuff and the ISC square knows that there's a lot of things that could have worked better. <laughs> Active directory itself still contains a lot of legacy of Microsoft. So, so um, Maurice pointed out that, you know, before NT351, they didn't do that. What did they do for naming? They did NetBIOS names. You know, that's still out there. People mm -hmm. still are supporting NetBIOS for, for some app that they couldn't kill or maybe they thought they couldn't turn it off. So the legacy stuff is really hard to kill off and that, that's important to know for the test as well. And in real life. All right, I'm sorry, Mo. No, no, no problem. And, and it just reminds me, there, there are still a lot of wind servers out there that handle... Net bias name resolution, <laughs> and it's uh, you know it's it's amazing that that still lives, sort of like the LS, uh, 
um, the OSI model never being implemented or uh, other things that probably were, were planned to go away and then are still still uh, still uh, around but um, so anyway we'll, we'll look in this particular situation we're, we're going to slice and dice this environment to basically have two sites a Chicago site and a and a Philadelphia site, and under there are going to be logical groupings of clients, uh, servers, users, and groups. We're going to break them up that way. Um, and it, it, in this case, you really, it, you can do anything you want in terms of delegation, and I'll talk more about delegation, which, which kind of illustrates some of the things that Larry will talk about later on, later on in the week. Um, so, Basically, a DC holds holds the NTDS DIT file, and 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 this is is are basically some key components to it. Um, let's head back over to here. We we talk about the DIT file uh, database replication. So the database is in you know in NT351 and in NT40 we had what was called a primary domain controller and a backup domain controller or several backup domain controllers. Um, so basically all changes were handled on the primary domain controller. All changes were, were made there and adds, deletions, changes, and then it replicated out to all the backup domain controllers. Well, uh, with Active Directory, uh, the age of a multi-master uh, database uh, was sprung. So if we go back to, we go back to this diagram, um, what that really means is I could be in the, if I'm an administrator in the Philadelphia site and I need to add a, a user, um, well, just going to add a user into the, do, into the, into the domain. That, that user gets added to the NTDS DIT file here. And then at some point there's a, there's a, a cycle that goes through that. Eventually this DC speaks to the DC in Chicago and, and tells it, Hey, I have some changes for you. You need to come here and pick them up, and and you know that'll. I actually, it, it should be. Um, I should mention to you, you, you can get, set something up called change notification, and you set it on the configuration attribute on what's called a a site link in AD, and it basically it basically uh, configures that behavior that uh, that I just spoke about. That is the DC where they change was sourced will tell all its replication partners hey come on come on over here and, and pick up a change that i just did and it's and it's a new user so the dc in chicago in this case will will communicate with the dc in philadelphia and pull those changes and incorporate it into this database so at the same time there could be a user in chicago or an administrator in chicago that that joins a workstation to the domain uh, when he joins it, it creates a computer object in the domain, and that's a change that's sourced on the Chicago domain controller. Well, the opposite then will occur, and that is the Chicago domain controller will notify the Philadelphia domain controller, I've got a change, I just added this computer object, come on over here and pick it up. The DC in Philadelphia will, will grab that change and incorporate it into the database. So that's how that's that's why they call it a multi-master uh, multi-master domain and multi-master replication. Um, so as opposed to a what would you call it a hub spoke where if there's one master just pushes out all the changes in the story? Yes, uh, I, I that's correct. It's sort of in a hub spoke model um, that way. And and it's funny and that's from the PDC uh, primary domain controller to the BDC, which is the backup domain controller. Right, right, right. And it's interesting, there's still legacy PDC references in Active Directory. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So that that stuff didn't easily go away and it's still still there today. Um, and and it, it plays some roles in terms of password changes, uh, account lockouts, and as well as time. It plays a role in time. Um, so where were we? Here we go. So we talked about database replication, DNS. So DNS is a very critical component of Active Directory, and it 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 
basically, and obviously you need name resolution. People don't, don't, don't reference things with IPs. So you need to be able to resolve an IP via a name via IP, vice versa. Um, and in Active Directory's uh, case and in the environments that, that mo I, I think most people do is, is they, they, they create a DNS zone uh, for the domain. And let me bring up uh, a DNS manager. So we talked about multi-master replication and that, for instance, uh, when I create, uh, let's let's just look at this. I create uh, a client. I'm new computer. I'll call him Larry. I just created this uh, again on the Philadelphia domain controller. And eventually, I'm sorry. When you went back, could you go back to that property? I want to leave. This is how prevalent that um, that legacy system was. Go back when you created it. It created a NetBIOS name for it. Did you notice that? It pre yes. it pre oh, Windows 2000. So yeah. that's how prevalent it was. It was right there. You just had it. It's, it's a, right a pre Windows 2000. So yep. that's how prevalent this crap is, and it's so hard. I, I'm sorry. I still think. It's so complex to configure this right that we're going to have to have AIs do this. Oh, absolutely. So my the illustration I want uh, the thing I want to illustrate here is uh, if I can see my give me a second here. Oh, here we go. Yes. It's Philly, DC. And I just want to illustrate this. Give me a second here. I'm going to change the domain controller. It's fine. While you're doing that, I, if anyone noticed that it made that machine name all caps, and I wanted yes. to kind of slowly dig, uh, get around this when I was planting seeds about ASCII. So uh, I said, when you tell what it's going to lead to is how strong a password or a key might be. So in NetBIOS, they reduce the entropy by converting everything to uppercase anyway. So NetBIOS, just in key, password, whatever strength, it's always weaker. It's always weaker for some and for nothing else, their implementation of ASCII. Okay. Thanks, Larry. So um, actually, the, the, re the replication should not take this long. So there's probably something on the back end that isn't working correctly. But eventually, we're going to see Larry's PC in here. And it could be that, that the uh, the in, initiate changes didn't 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 take place. So, in any event, what I'm trying to illustrate here is with DNS. Is it, is it a DNS issue? <laughs> it could be, could be. I, I only built this thing last night, <laughs> late last night. So I didn't give people time. So thank you again, Mo. I appreciate oh, no. it. I'm sorry if it makes you look bad here. <laughs> no, 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 no sweat. Um, so um, basically, a DNS. Um, a DNS zone, you know, we, we talked about the, DN, the DNS zones here, and we, they, you can create a DNS zone in the standard way where you have a, a primary zone and a secondary, but the thing that's important here is that typically in an AD environment, you create an Active Directory integrated. And what that means is any changes within DNS are going to ride on top of the replication engine that 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 other ad changes uh take use so let me let me pause here for because it's really good stuff that i, I and i thank you for putting this in because it's think of this guys the reason you're named this thing is x.500 active directory is microsoft's implementation just like ldap is a, a unix or linux implementation of that naming scheme dns says that x.500 name maps to this ip address and that'll be important when we do network on day four. PKI, which we're going to start today, will, will say, and now this is a certificate authority validating, you know, the, some federation thing. VeriSign says that this 
Active Directory name really does belong to this IP address. So all that ties together, Active Directory, DNS, PKI. So let's go into a few other things. So, you know, I, I, I'm going to go off script here a little bit just to really just hammer home. What, what do we have here? This is what the, the, the domain, the domain looks like. Now, what is it? What's, what's it made up of? We have what's called built-in accounts and groups. So just to really quick, quickly highlight what some of the, 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 the main ones are. There's something called the account operators group. And that the account operators group is, you know, is, is sort of the, it, 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 ha, it has a lot of power. It, it has a lot of rights that have been delegated to it. It's, 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 it's uh, a level below a domain admin. So we know, and it's well known that domain administrators are, are the, the king of the hill. They're, they're, well, they're well if we look at the operating rights. system and we say the OS does three basic things. It knows hardware, it knows applications, it knows users. <clears throat> the account operators gives you admin privileges just over the users, right? It, it, they couldn't make a hardware change. Is that, is that accurate? Co correct. Well, it's more so uh, it, the ACLs to the objects themselves within AD. That's right. where, that's where, yeah. that's right. It doesn't make, you, you, you know, it's, you don't have rights to the, to the DC itself and to be able to make system changes there. So, and just to, just to um, illustrate that, give me a second here, let me open up the view. Um, you'll, see, you'll see a smattering of the, the security for all these OUs um, and you will notice account operators, okay? You will see uh, rights delegated to account operators throughout this whole tree. And if we if we uh, look at the advanced properties, um, and let's sort it. Well, you can see here you can create and delete INET org org objects, create and delete computer objects, uh, create and delete uh, group objects at the, at this particular OU, create and delete user objects. So by default, you uh, these uh, users in that group can do can make those changes. Pretty powerful. Um, and it, 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 in my, in my experience, we've, you know, I, and I'll, uh, you know, it, it's, it's full transparency early on in the early days of AD, um, uh, there were too many domain admins and it was just, it was to sort of circumvent, um, you know, really digging into the delegation to see and understand what people need. So a lot of times domain admin privileges were given out too easily. I um, did a, I did a, um, a, a, a vulnerability assessment for a very large power company in uh, Nevada and they supply power to four states. And this was in 2003. They had 11 admins that signed in as administrator. <laughs> oh my God. And, and they li they lived in that admin, that, that account all day. They had full rights and there was no way to account for who did what. If someone made a change, it was one of them. <laughs> oh my gosh! They changed yeah. it that day. But that wasn't very un that wasn't uncommon at the time, and and it's it's changed quite a bit. Um, well, it's hopefully it's changed quite a bit. Uh, so we talked about domain admins. So the other interesting thing, which I don't quite, I never really looked into, but there's a default user uh, container. Um, that has some of the built-in accounts like domain admins, domain computers, domain controllers group, why they're in there versus in, 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 a in the built-in in built container, uh, I don't know. But uh, Maybe it would just be easier for people to create funny. templated users, but yeah, it is kind of weird. Yeah, so it, and, and yeah, all, the, all these high-powered groups are just rather interesting. I mean, by default, when you create a user, that's, that's the user's container is where it's going to go. So you, right. you know, or you, you can actually create it in the, in this, in the final destination. So to go back to the built-in, so we talked about account operators. Don't, I mean, the domain admins, you'll, you'll see that everywhere. You'll see, you'll see those rights. Let me see, especially in, in the domain controllers container, you will see domain admins have tons of rights in, 
all, all over there. And that, that makes total sense. That's just the way the, the model is set up. Um, hmm. So again, there, there are many groups that, that kind of leverage and provide you with delegation. Um, the, we talked about the domain controllers group. That holds, that's really just a place to hold all the DCs in, in the domain. Um, we talked about users and then the other part is anything that's custom is what, what you're going to uh, create that's going to apply to you. Um, and while I'm here, I might as well do it because I laid it out this way. So I created an admin OU and that, that's, that's where I want to keep all my administrative accounts. And it'll make a little more sense when we talk about group policies. So we have an, an, an admin OU and underneath that admin OU, I created, you know, I got a little creative. My, my user, my computer names sort of dropped off Larry. So, but I, I created some admin accounts called Kirk, Spock, Quasar, and, and Chai, just, just for your benefit. All right. Yeah. So these are the these are the accounts that were created i created a bunch of groups and this is where i say you can slice and dice delegation any way you want so keep in mind here um i broke it up i made it so granular and you don't have to get this granular if you look at you'll see a chai client admins right and under the chai under the chai ou you will see a clients a client's OU, organizational unit. So what, what I've done there is I, I actually went and delegated, and I'll, I'll show you that I want um, clients being workstation computer objects. So I, I, I took that, created that group, no members in it, that's okay. But I ACLED, I delegated control, and if you look at the security properties of it, I went and, and we'll, we'll go to the, the advanced tab here. And you'll notice client admins have create and delete all child objects and it's create and delete computer objects. So what does that mean? And it's this object and all, all, all descendant uh, OUs, if there are any that are created underneath. So basically any member of that group has the ability to create and delete computer objects under this OU and that's all they can do. They try right. to create a group under there, try to create a user, they're, they're, they're SOL. Um, so basically, just to illustrate it, we, we have it for, you know, an admin for group creations in Chicago, creation of server objects, creation of user objects, and, and the corresponding for the, for the Philly. Uh, now, uh, you guys migrated a bunch of stuff into Azure. How easy was it to take your existing servers, the, the hardware maintained stuff, and, and put them into Azure? What were some of the challenges there? We, you know, by the time I, by the time I, I uh, when I left there, uh, Larry, we didn't do a whole lot of that. That wasn't done. We didn't really uh, migrate, uh, you know, didn't migrate servers into, into the Azure space. It was that really seems so common, leverage. actually. You know where I'm seeing that, especially it, it, large organizations, especially with their email, they have yet to fully, you know, a lot of people are maintaining their own stuff yet. You know, uh, if you're a new organization, you start from the cloud on up. But if you have a legacy mail server and, and some, uh, uh, so this is going to tie in another thing that this is going to create. So you talked about federated stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Having a PKI will help trust that. But, you know, you could have your own internal certificate authorities and all this stuff, or I can have a, you know, a trusted external CA, and I could have somebody else maintain all of this for me. And this is going to bleed into uh, a very testable uh, concept that we'll deal on for the day for SAML, the uh, security assertion mm -hmm. markup language and how all of this gets split up your active directory, where some of it could be maintained at your place. Some of it could be maintained at whatever Okta, some ID as a service provider. And then your application, you know, is your SaaS providers can still respect all of this information and trust it and, and make backend calls via SAML. So you have like a single sign on for, for all of this domain, even though it's distributed across, you know, uh, whatever various providers. Cool stuff, Mel. Exactly. Yeah, and you know, and this this is an area that I, I'm I'm looking into, and it's a work in progress. But there are configurations in Azure that uh, where they cre they automatically create the certificates, they, the you know the public and private key. Sure. Um, sure. So 
those the filling in those blanks are 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 are, are great because that it's 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 a lot of moving parts. I, I could see where going into a cloud really makes it a lot easier to roll out a public uh, C, a PKI because it's hard. Most people who, uh, who rolled out PKI in the 90s and early zeros for me did it for their publicly facing web servers, but they didn't do it for their internal email clients. You know? No. No, when people are digitally signing documents, it's, it works for, between people in your domain, in your company, but then, you know, you don't have that CA's key on outside. So that in the cloud, they already are federated anyway. So. It's true. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, we talked about the, you know these containers and what what they do. Um, let's go back to what else does a DC hold? Well, we talked about DNS, and actually, you know what? Let me go back to that. So as as we talked about the 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 zone, the Quasar.com zone is Active Directory integrated. And one of the things that you um, to keep in mind that is where DNS is such a critical component, it's what's called uh, certain record types in, in, in DNS, and they are what's called SRV records. And what those records are used for is to be able to find out what, the, you know, it's, it, it allows you to, to um, query to find out what DCs you should speak to in order to do things like authenticate, do things like um, know when you want to do an LDAP query on the client, um, what server do you go to? So, and it's broken up, uh, you know, again, we're, it's the recurring theme. We have, uh, we have sites that really hold specific SRV records. And if you look in Chicago, the, the records for the Chicago DC are, are what you're going to see. Uh, registered and also as a function of a, a domain controller domain controllers dynamically register all their SRV records their a records and their pointer records and you'll notice here are the timestamps of the SRV records in this case and that just indicates that they are they are dynamic and they do have a lifetime um, so in the Chicago site you'll see the DC for Chicago in the Philly site you'll see the DC in Philly that registered those those records. Um, so what does this allow you to do? It allows you to, um, and I'll, I'll give an example. Um, I'm in Philadelphia on a client. Um, I first thing I do is it, when my, my uh, client boots up, the net logon service tries to figure out what site do I belong to and it, it basically determines that through, through a series of APIs and um, not to get too deep in it. Um, at some point it needs to, it based on the site, once it figures out what site it's in, it knows how to form the, SR, uh, the query for the SRV records. Once it does that, it gets a, a uh, produces, a, initiates a query and it finds out I'm in Philadelphia, I'm going to go to that Philadelphia DC if it's available. If it's not reachable, It'll, it, it'll just, it'll, it'll move up to a different, you know, um, DNS query. And you'll notice in this case, it might move up to find a, a, another SRV, uh, another DNS query that will give you any one of the DCs, which is a combination of the Philly one and one in Chicago. So then it would go to the Chicago uh, DC if the Philadelphia DC wasn't available. Um, what you're trying to do is reduce latency in terms of providing services. So I want my, uh, my client in Philadelphia to talk to my, uh, my DC in Philadelphia. I don't want my client to talk to my DC in Shanghai because that's just going to be unusable. Um, if you're in trouble and that's the only one available, well, that's what you're stuck with. But you know, basically, sites and services, the SRV records, try to optimize authentication and give you the ability to get your references local. Make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I, for, for, I, I said it to the, the group, I'll just pref or remember it again, remind you again. Maurice and I worked at a, a trading firm and Mo just left there last year. So he spent 20 plus years at a, a, an environment where performance is everything and, and to stress just how bad. They didn't like uh, on their servers um, commercial network interface cards because they were too slow. 
They built their own network right. interface cards. This place spent money on performance. Availability, number one. Yes, and I, I, um, that's a good point, Larry. And it reminds me, when I talk about time, that, that really comes into play. And uh, they built their own cards. They need to execute their, their tasks or transactions you know, as quickly as possible and at the closest place. So yes, that, 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 that's a good point. And, and you were reminding me that I, I think it was the 351, I don't even remember it was that site, about that replicating over a different uh, site, where that actually happened, where for some reason, and it was like some registry entry left in from a machine that was migrated and they kept trying to replicate over a slow link to a different DC. We're like, why is it doing that? Yeah, it's some stupid thing, but I don't mean to keep slowing you down. This is great no. stuff. I could let you go for a day, dude. Uh, but we, we, we've got a couple more minutes here. Oh, you do? What, what do we have to? Uh, we, well, we could, we could do one thirty. If we could go a little later, it's okay. This is great okay. stuff. And this relates to a lot of what we're doing. Uh, but you didn't okay. want to get too deep, you said, on that one thing of how it knows. But it does start, when, and, and it's very testable to know, when you turn on a machine, a client machine, what is the first network device it typically establishes a communication with in IPv4? What's the major communication before it can do any of this stuff, before it can get into the directory, before it can find DHCP? That's why it's a great server to impersonate as. It's one of our first rogue infrastructure devices is to set up rogue DHCPs. We don't authenticate them really well. But that's not true in IPv6, is it? They stopped asking IPv6 questions on this test. I don't know why, but they should be asking more. What is the first device you talk to in IPv6? Mm. A router. And if you don't secure that, you can't fix that. Rogue routers will always be an IPv6. Luckily, we have IPsec to fix that, but it doesn't work. So good luck on that, guys. Good luck if you're doing IPv6 and how. To, uh, you know, who, a former uh, colleague of, of Maurice and I's is was the IPv6 architect for Netflix. I would love to get him to talk, dude. He thinks I'm a dweeb. Uh, so if you could get him to talk, if you could convince him to talk, he's so good. He is so smart. He, he he's a character, but he's, he's awesome. And and. and he he did. I want to know how he did that, and I guarantee he's smart enough to know the vulnerability and f came up with some way to fix it. You, have you reached out to him, Larry? I I actually he had he was looking for somebody, and I had promoted him in uh, in in Facebook. I said this is one of the smartest guys I've ever worked with, and I think he was surprised. And he was like, "Gee, thanks." <laughs> <laughs> he was he was a smart guy. And uh, yeah, he's pretty high up in, in Netflix. He was a kid when he worked for us. He was like 19, but I knew right then he was smart. He was just a yeah. big goofy kid. Yeah, he, was, he was a savant. Um, okay, so you know what? I, I just saw some, before I get to service tickets, um, going back to authentication, I think this diagram probably il illustrates what we were just talking about. So I showed you the topology of the, of the Azure domain I had, right? Here's something a little more complex. That was simple. So you have here, you have site A, um, and you have site B, C, and you have D. And where you see these links, um, there you, you, you associate those costs um, with each link uh, when you define them. So if you look in this example, this is a client. And let's, let's, let's just say this domain controller goes away. It's not there. It's unavailable. This client is going to, it, it figures out what are my costs, what are my site costs uh, to, to, what's the next closest site? And, and, and it's based on cost. So it will go and, and, and authenticate via the DC that's in site A. And if that one isn't available, it'll go to site C. If that one isn't, it'll go to D. If none of them are available, you've got a problem. So, um, so hopefully that kind of illustrates that it and and you know I like to try to tie in sites and services with with the actual um, tool that we use. Uh, there it is. Sorry, I can't see some of this stuff. Um, so when you this is the sites and services tool, and this is how you define the topology. So again, we have two sites, PHL in Chicago. Within uh, those sites, you see the the DCs uh, in both. Then you see who my replication partner is. And this is, 
this is where Active Directory automatically automatically does this. Um, but it also it it also you can kind of drive this based on how you set your topology. You know, I'll talk about that via site link. So you'll see here. Uh, the Philly DC is, rep is replication partner in Chicago um, and vice versa in Chicago. The replication partner is the PHL DC. Now we, we have to define all the subnets. If you don't define all the subnets, the, the clients will just wander aimlessly to try to find any DC that's going to talk to it. So you have to define subnets and you have to associate it with the site. So as you can see, I have a, a subnet in, in the Philly site, and I have one in the Chicago site. Now, now uh, you can slide that and summarize that masks, I guess. So if Philadelphia had whatever, all of the 10s, you could say 10 slash 8. And if Chicago was 11, or whatever, right? Right. No, okay. ab absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, and as a matter of fact, that's a good point, Larry, because if you know, if you know 10.10, .10, if you had a 10.0 slash 16, right? Mm -hmm. um, or, um, 10.0.0.0 slash 16, because you've designed your architect, you architect it so that 10.0 uh, and anything, any network slash uh, networks underneath that are part of PHL. That sort of eases your administrative burden. Um, in, in situations I've been in, if we, if you, if you, if you have to define it at the slash 24, sure, sure. sometimes, you know, when you have firewall networks, right? You, a lot of times you'll do a slash 28 so that you can, you don't need that many. You don't want to just use up the IP address space. So it kind of saves you uh, some administrative. Uh, yeah, there'll be there. a couple of questions like that on the test, guys. For you network people who can get that, that's great and pick that up because you're probably going to screw up business continuity. If network isn't your strong point, don't worry too much about those types of things, but route summarization could easily show up, you know, that, that, that's something, but they're not common knowledge. They don't weigh heavily. Yeah. Keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. So uh, in, in, in here, in under this is where you define, again, you're, you're, you're trying to architect it and build a topology. I define just one, because I only have two sites, I defined a site link called Philly to Chicago, and I gave it a cost. It defaults to 100, but you know it has a cost of 100. We had another site in San Francisco to Philadelphia, and that cost was 300. Then you know you start building some smarts around authentication. So the lower the cost, the better. The lower the cost, the the the. The, the you know more reliable that, the better the speed the more priority the higher the priority the, the higher priority the the the, the it really it, it dictates how you're you're sending your where you're sending those off authentication requests right. and just just real quick you know this isn't a tech note that i've seen this is where and you know you're not it's not this isn't useful for other than what i've i've done with it um this this use notify attribute for this site link up here yeah. that's what tells it what i was talking about whereas it notifies when i have a change on my dc it notifies all its replication partners to say come get yeah. it for, you know as a network nerd I, I i just have a question even though i'm going to eat up more time is that throw a multicast <laughs> how is that how is that announcement made do you know what the packet it is no. Oh no, I don't know. Okay, just um, no. It's it's it it well. It, somehow it knows who its replication partners are, and I, it it directs it. It directs yeah. it to that DC. Yeah, yeah. I'm just curious because yeah, what am I sitting there thinking? Can I lie? Can I inject a phony? Because I'm sure those things could be signed. You know, with like a uh, mm. what's that um, that Microsoft signing thing when they sign the registry entry? So, oh come on, help me, guys. Uh, CEA just have to know it. SMB signing, SMB signing. SMB signing, right, right, right. Uh, okay, so um, so DCs do all this. We can talk, I mean, we're running out of time, but service tickets, just no, um, service tickets are what's used to, uh, you know, I think Larry is either going to talk about it, but when you, when you uh, power up a, a machine and, 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 and it's, it's, it's connected and logged in. There, there's something called, and you use the analogy, a, T, a TGT, right? You get a ticket to get into the amusement park. Now you want to get access to a ride or a, a web server. You need to get a, a, a service ticket, to, a ticket to get on that ride or connect to that web server. 
Well, your client is going to is going to try to get a via Kerberos, try to get a service ticket to be able to present that to the, the web server in order to get in. Now, all that DNS, the underlying DNS uh, uh, plays an important role here because it's got to do a query for an SRV record to see who can service the, who can service, uh, you know, my Kerberos request. Right. So, and that's, yeah, that's, so that's all the, that's what you, you just said the magic word. This is going to relate to Kerberos, which we're going to do in day four. Yep. Okay. Great. So, um, also we talked about this, you know, it, the DC is the keeper of a lot of objects. The main ones are computer user and group objects. And then we have something called group policies. Um, if I can touch on that, Larry, um, yeah. then, uh, it's good then, stuff, please. And so there's a lot of stuff that, by the way, that sounds like only mandatory access control models can do versus discretionary. <clears throat> and then people bring up in class, but we kind of do that, Larry, with, with uh, group policies. And I go, yeah, you do. Even though that's considered technically in the orange book definition of DAC, it's not a Mac. But Microsoft is more than your standard DAC. It's just not Mac. We'll know more about that later. But that, you're, go ahead, please do show it because it is important. Sure, no problem. I'm trying to see if I can find it. Here we go. Good. All right. So we talked about a uh, group policies um, and by default, th this, this domain's pristine. So I don't, I didn't really do a whole lot of uh, any policy manipulation here, but when you create a domain, there's always something called the default domain policy. Um, and in that policy, typically by default, it's where your, your user and password policies are, are, are defined. And you'll notice here right out of the box, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll see, and it's a user-based policy, for, and some some quirky reason, and uh, that it, it's under what's called the computer configuration, and we'll talk more about that. But in you know, they used to have a lot of questions on password policies. I don't know if they still do, but this used to be big when I first started to, this. This whole uh, enforced password history, maximum password age, this was all, all very testable. And it. Um, so you, you, you see that you can have, a, this is the ma maximum password age. Uh, how long, what's the minimum amount of time? So they can't can change, change it back to their favorite password. Oh, I have to do a, a, to wait a day. day. Or a 20 foot password. So 20 I'll do 25 <laughs> times today. No, you can't do that. Because <laughs> I want that. it to be Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. So that's pretty tight. I mean, I, I've, I've seen it looser than that. But um, minimum password length, what's the ca complexity? Et cetera, et cetera. So the you know the other interesting thing in it, we talked about the progression of, of of Windows Server and in the domain. One one incremental thing that I think it was 2012 or 2016. It's 2012. It, it was fine grained password policies. So in order to in the in the old days, in order to have two different password policies, you'd have to have two separate domains. Um, in order to have you know for even compliance reasons to have. Maybe, so, uh, like HR people have to have longer password requirements than whatever than correct some lower risk per people. So you would have to create two separate domains. But now I can two I can have like maybe say I have three type of um, of risk uh, uh, di uh, whatever designations for types of users and and the, the high risk ones have a different password policy. Right, and it's it's the term is fine grained password policies, and it's based on. Uh, there's a manipulation you, you, you need to go through and there's a tech note on there that it's basically, you, it's based on group so group membership. And so HR groups and members of the HR team are, are put in a group and that gets this fine grained password policy, which is love different it, than love the default. It, love it, love it, love it. So it, it, it actually- Peter, that was, actually uh, that was Peter's question. And Peter, I, I, I don't know if what's on the test. I, I just uh, know that that's a great question to ask. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. So, um, just like, you know, you, you can come in here and, and I'm going to, I don't know if I, it really, need, we're running out of time, but just, just safe it to say, I can also, and I've done it in the past where instead of, uh, I managed group policies for the entire enterprise, um, but as the enterprise gets bigger, it, it gets unwieldy. So what you end up doing, and again, it's that point of delegation. Um, I ended up delegating the ability to the desktop engineers to be able to create and delete policies um, and they test them in a sandbox. So I gave them the ability and, and let's see if we can, we can uh, just, just look at it real quick. Um, 
we're at my main group policy. Uh, let me find uh, users. Here, here we go. So um, in users and computers, I, I can provide the ability, delegate control, right? And I can go in here, and I don't know, I'm going to give admin Spock uh, a certain ability, and it's manage group policy links. So what that lets me do is if I'm admin Spock, now I've given him the ability to link and unlink group policies to, to this uh, try clients OU, right? And that's pretty powerful. Let's say you have a thousand, a thousand um, computer objects in there that are workstations that are in Chicago. You make a change there, that could really impact every object within that OU. Yeah. So, and the other thing, I mean, it, it, there's so many facets to this. You can even, there's a lot of things you can do to filter out. You can actually go in and, um, and uh let's see here well whatever happened to sms what did that become sms holy mackerel system management service remember that uh, sccm is that what that because remember how powerful that was and it would do stuff that sucked <laughs> it yes. would write stuff to, to all the dcs that we didn't want it to do <laughs> yeah ab no absolutely it was you know, i've seen i've seen production outages from that. So let's do just real quick to illustrate what I was talking about. Um, so I'm, I'm creating a group policy. All right, GP1, I don't care what's in it. But delegation wise, you can see all authenticated users are going to read it, right? But you can you can um, actually add, um, I'm going to say, uh, PHL client. Uh, do I have it right? Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Let's just say admin Kirk. Check names, and you can, you can, uh, you can give him the ability to edit. And that, that's not what I actually wanted to do. I wanted uh, to read it, um, but if I wanted it to exempt, uh, oh, it's denied. That's right. Hold on. Okay, so I've gone to admin Kirk, and I can sit here and deny him the ability to read and apply the group policy. So basically, if I have a user base setting on a policy um, and it tells you, hey, you're denying this person. So if admin Kirk, if there's a group policy um, uh, that, that's applied and I wanted to exempt admin Kirk from getting it, he's not going to, he's not going to get it. And it, it, it's basically a way to kind of surgically apply group policies. It's typically not a good practice, but invariably, you're always going to run into those those exempts those exceptions. Um, I'm doing that, which so, are very testable. We we would document exceptions all the time on this test. So, um, so Larry, I did. I think I went over most of what I let me let me look real quick. I could talk about DFS and time. Do you have Do you have a moment to talk about time? Yes. Okay. So time, time is very important in, in Active Directory. I'll skip DFS. It's not really that related. Um, it could be. We could do it. If you could, don't mind, back on day five when we talk about uh, file systems, maybe I'd, I'd ask you to, do, to get into that. Because that, how does that relate in cloud versus with like the, um, uh, the dis, what are they called, disperse, dispersion, data dispersion and stuff like that? Do you know how Microsoft and everything is doing that in the background? Um, ye yes, I don't know how they're doing it in the background in Azure, but with DFS, you have the, a, a few things. The main function with DFS is to divorce the name of a file server um, from, from being an issue because invariably, and if you remember it at the old company, they had a box called Bala, right? Uh -huh. and, and that name lived on forever. It, it was sort of like NetBias. It was a NetBias thing. It's right? a NetBias legacy thing, yeah. You can't control people use hard coding a name of a server. And what DFS is one of its main things that allows you to do, and we could talk about it then, um, is divorce the name and have some common reference to how to get to the share. Um, but in terms of replication, DFS brings in the ability to replicate, replicate data between two servers that provide access to the same DFS path. And we, 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 okay. we can go over that. Then. Yeah, yeah. Let's do the time and save that one okay, day five. Sure. So, um, in the time, 
let's see, bring up this. So in this environment, uh, the Philly DC is what's called the PDC emulator. And in Microsoft's domain time hierarchy, um, the PDC emulator is the master time server. So whatever, everybody, the, 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 the Philly DC in this case is our master time server. And the Chicago DC is basically getting its time from the Philly DC and syncing its time. So um, what you, we, we have to be aware of, and I don't have it here because it's just a test, test uh, setup. There are well-documented configurations you can do for the, for the PDC emulator. You want to point the PDC emulator to a, a, a hardware clock that syncs its time off of G, GPS. In environments that I've been in, you know, we've had we've had ten eight hardware clocks that were all syncing to GPSs, and basically we would point this PDC emulator DC to the a few of those hardware clocks, so we know its clock is on, right? So then then the Chicago DC basically uh, has its syncs its time to that, and the all clients will sync to whatever DC that it's that it's working with and talking to. So, and I can show you really quick. I think I've had it. Um, uh, where is it? Uh, I'm gonna have to W thirty two TM uh, slash strip chart slash computer. Um, uh, PHLDC. So what I'm showing here is give me the time. You see that little O there. I'm showing you the time offset from this client, which is the PHL client from uh, the DC, which is the PDC emulator. And you'll see here it's three milliseconds. So I'd round that up to four, my friend. All right. 3.7. Right. But, but it's interesting here. I mean, Windows time was horrible. It, it, way back when and it, it, if you were able to get two seconds you were golden right so i mean in the environments that i that i've worked in they're now talking they they need tolerances of hundreds of microseconds so in other words you're going even farther down guys this is going to be important to you uh in, in your test for two purposes primarily i think one is exactly what we're showing here this is database replication uh stuff and if it's not they're not synchronized and you delete a user on one server they go oh no he's not deleted you got the old record so it's important in database replication and especially at this level of precision but it's also going to be important when we do forensics and we correlate logs Oh, absolutely. And that's, that's actually so, so critical because now you're dealing with, you know, a, a lot of people are aggregating all their domain controller logs and they're sending it, sending it off and shipping it up to some security information event management system. If, if your times on your firewalls and your DCs and your, and your, and your, your, your servers are off, you can't correlate. It makes correlation, event correlation so much more difficult. It, it's incompetent. Um, in, in evidence, we say evidence has to be material, competent, and relevant. And this would, uh, you know, question the the competency. And, and besides all that, you know, with Kerberos, if you're off by five minutes, Kerberos just breaks, and it just, just, it, it, it just, your all, all your Kerberos uh, tickets and 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 all that Kerberos authentication just just breaks. So you 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 definitely you, your client, your servers, and and everything everything related to the domain need to have their time within a certain tolerance. Five minutes is where Kerberos breaks. Five minutes is horrible. I mean, you never want to be that high, but. I kind of remember, if I, that's what NTP does, right? NTP, remember it's NTP, <laughs> run a port, one, two, three. That's exactly the point. And the first time I heard about it was at that site where we were, and it was the colleague who shared your room, we'll call him Dave, and he taught me about what that was. And I remember, oh, well, that makes sense. And he was telling me that it was interesting. They were, uh, now, these were early days. This is the 90s. But it was uh, even to synchronize the clock. Like, if you find that your clock is five minutes off, you don't want to immediately just at five minutes off. He said you would set no the first time, do it like three minutes, or, you know, bring it down and then make it half of that, one and a half or something. There was something yes. about synchronizing the clocks that you didn't want to immediately jump. 
I think, yeah, gosh, it's been a while. And I, uh, it had to do with replication. Yeah, it was about sure replication. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, yep. That you couldn't uh, immediately, and you didn't want to down the server, you know. I mean, these are these are trading firm servers. We just want to fix it with the least amount of impact. That's awesome. Mo, thank you so much. Any, any questions for Maurice here? Uh, sorry, I haven't been looking at the chat. No, I've been checking there. Any of okay. those guys? I hope everybody appreciates as much as I did. There's a lot, a lot of testable stuff that comes out of this. Some of it skips ahead to things we're going to talk about on day four, like uh, X.500, Active Directory, LDAP, whatever. Uh, PKI, I, I, you know, is how it validates that. Uh, but you know, I just like to have and see it, uh, you know, how the real world works. A lot of times people are like, yeah, it sounds good at a test, you know, but how does the real world?